Let me begin by thanking President Clinton for your initiative, for your leadership, for your faith in bringing this rather unique group together. Your confidence that people working together can tackle any problem has certainly been proven in this case. I also want to thank you for the critical role played by former Secretary of Labor Robert Reich in this process and carried on so ably by Maria Echevesti, who never gave up, and her colleagues at the Department of Labor, and of course the timely assistance of Gene Sperling, who also had faith in the process. It has been a difficult and arduous process for all of us involved. The companies, the unions, the human rights consumers, and religious organizations. But I do not think it is an exaggeration to say that we have taken a very historic step forward. All of us with a stake in this industry, a stake in this new global economy, a stake in our democratic way of life have found common ground and mapped out a route to dignity and respect for workers in the industry throughout the world. It's the continuation of an enormously complex process. To succeed, we will need the patience and persistence that have gotten us this far. We must continue to listen to each other, to the voices of workers who suffer the indignities and inhumanity of the sweatshop, to the American people whose decency and compassion have time and time again weighed in on the side of justice and freedom when they have been given the choice, to employers who recognize that in our new global village, their responsibilities are also global. I believe that is the message of what we have accomplished so far, a message of corporate responsibility in this new global economy, of corporations, of retailers, designers, manufacturers, contractors, this corporate enterprise of many elements assuming responsibility for conditions under which the goods they sell have been produced, a message about the rights of workers being human rights. Many of you know that our union, Unite, has been engaged in this struggle for nearly a century. We know that there are no magic bullets or quick fixes. But we have also seen that when the constituencies assembled in this room have joined forces to eradicate the evils of sweatshops, we have made real progress. This is therefore a moment of great hope and confidence in the future. As we come to the end of one century and the beginning of another, we find ourselves at the beginning of a process that can and should bring dignity to the workplace and make this global village a decent place for all of, all of its inhabitants. Unite and the entire labor movement is proud to pledge its continuing support for this historic effort. Let us now move forward together. Thank you. And with pleasure, let me introduce the co-chair of our group, Linda Galadna, president of the National Consumer League. Linda. Thank you. Mr. President, eight months ago, you called together representatives from the apparel industry, labor unions, human rights, religious, and consumer groups. You charged us to find a way to end sweatshops in the industry and to effectively relay that to consumers. Today, the Apparel Industry Partnership is very pleased to present our report. It indeed represents an unprecedented dedication by all participants, companies, and organizations. It is a monumental achievement. Consumers demand assurance, assurance that a woman or child on the other side of the globe or here in the United States is not abused, is not working 14 and 15 hour days, seven days a week for pennies an hour. Teenagers don't want to wear clothes that children in Indonesia or Los Angeles have given up their childhood to make. Consumers demand sweatshop free clothing. People want to change the way they shop they want industry to change the way they do business. And consumers need credible, independent sources of information so that they can make the right choices in the marketplace. The National Consumers League was founded nearly 100 years ago because at the turn of the century, 
consumers decided that they did not want to buy clothing made in sweatshops. Today, we commit ourselves to ending sweatshops as we enter the next century. And what we present to you today, Mr. President, is the beginning. It is my pleasure to introduce the co-chair and chief executive office of Liz Claiborne, a company that is a leader to end sweatshops, Paul Sheeran. Thank you very much, Linda, and uh, thank you, Mr. President, for having the foresight to recognize that companies could work together with labor, with human rights, and with consumer organizations toward the common goal of improving labor conditions around the world. We cannot forget the contributions, however, of this administration, particularly the Department of Labor and former Labor Secretary Bob Reich. I also must acknowledge the tireless efforts of both Maria Echeveste and Jean Sperling. Further, I would like to express my deep appreciation for, to uh, all of those from industry, labor, human rights, and consumer groups who contributed to this effort. And of course, I would like to thank Robbie Karp, Liz Claiborne's general counsel and vice president of corporate affairs, who co-chaired the task force. Someone said that it took two women to make this all happen. <laughs> Knowing those two women, I believe it. <laughs> the standards and processes developed by the Apparel Industry Partnership are certainly groundbreaking. Today, we have built a framework to more credibly address a serious and very complex problem. But the success of the partnership's framework for improving working conditions depends on the industry's ability to recruit its peers. We must be realists. We must be problem solvers. And our first challenge is this, persuading our colleagues in the apparel and footwear industries, colleagues who are not represented here today, to join the fight. In short, we have not come here to announce victory, but to proclaim a new challenge. And that is to make this truly an industry-wide effort. There is no other way. The skeptics, and there are a few, may ask, why do this? And the answer is simple. We do this because it is good business. Some in the industry may think that the companies standing here are taking an unnecessary risk. They may wonder how we can afford to make this commitment. I would ask them in return, how can we afford not to? Ensuring human rights is the right thing to do, and it is also the smart thing to do because good working conditions are productive working conditions. Let me emphasize that we are faced with a unique opportunity to make further progress. And again, our goal is to make this into an unprecedented industry-wide effort. This is only the start. The truly great accomplishments are yet to come. Please join us to help this partnership fulfill its true potential. And now it is my great honor to introduce the President of the United States, Mr. President. I would like to begin, first of all, by thanking all the members of this partnership, uh, the co-chairs, Paul Sharon, of Liz Claiborne, and Linda Gladner, of the National Consumers League, Jay Mazur of Unite. I thank uh, Kathy Lee Gifford, who has done so much to bring public attention to this issue. I thank the members of Congress who are here, uh, Congressman George Miller, Congressman Bernie Sanders, Congressman Lane Evans, Congressman Marty Martinez, and especially I thank uh, my good friend, Senator Tom Harkin, who first brought this issue to my attention a long time ago. Thank you very much, sir, and thank all of you for your passion and concern. Um, I 
I thank uh, the former Secretary of Labor, Bob Rice, and Acting Secretary Cynthia Metzler and Secretary-designate Alexis Herman, who's here, and I thank uh, Maria Echeveste and Jean Sperling uh, for their work. The announcement we make today will improve the lives of millions of garment workers around the world. As has now been painfully well documented, some of the clothes and shoes we buy here in America are manufactured under working conditions which are deplorable and unacceptable, mostly overseas, but unbelievably sometimes here at home as well. In our system of enterprise, which I have done my best to promote and advance, we support the proposition that businesses are in business to make a profit. But in our society, which we believe to be good and want to be better, we know that human rights and labor rights must be a part of the basic framework within which all businesses honorably compete. As important as the fabric apparel workers make for us is the fabric of their lives, which is a part of the fabric of our lives here at home and around the world. Their health and their safety, their ability to make a decent wage, their ability to bring children into this world and raise them with dignity and have their children see their parents working with dignity, that's an important part of the quality of our lives and will have a lot to do with the quality of our children's future. Last August, uh, when the Vice President and I brought together the leaders of some of our nation's largest apparel and footwear companies and representatives of labor, consumer, human rights, and religious groups, I was genuinely moved at the shared outrage at sweatshop abuses and the shared determination to do something about it. That led to this apparel industry partnership. This partnership has reached an agreement, as already has been said, that will significantly reduce the use of sweatshop labor over the long run. It will give American consumers greater confidence in the products they buy. And again, I say they have done a remarkable thing. Paul Sharon said it was just the beginning because even though there are some very impressive and big companies represented on this stage, there are some which are not. But I would like to ask all the members of the partnership here to stand, and I think we ought to express our appreciation to them for what they have done. So thank you. <clears throat> now, here's what they agreed to do. First, a workplace code of conduct that companies will voluntarily adopt and require their contractors to adopt to dramatically improve the conditions under which goods are made. The code will establish a maximum work week, a cap of 12 hours on the amount of overtime a company can require, require that employers pay at least the minimum or prevailing wage, respect basic labor rights. It will require safe and healthy working conditions and freedom from abuse and harassment. Most important, it will crack down on child labor, prohibiting the employment of those under 15 years of age in most countries. It will also take steps to ensure that this code is enforced and that American consumers will know that the tenets of the agreement are being honored. The apparel industry has developed new standards for internal and external monitoring to make sure companies and contractors live up to that code of conduct. It will also form an independent association to help implement the agreement and to develop an effective way to share this information with consumers, such as labels on clothing, seals of approval and advertising, or signs in stores to guarantee that no sweatshop labor was used on a given product line. Of course, the agreement is just the beginning. We know sweatshot labor will not vanish overnight. 
We know that while this agreement is an historic step, our real measure of progress must be in the changed and improved lives and livelihoods of apparel workers here at home and around the world. That is why we need more companies to join this crusade and follow its strict rules of conduct. One of the Association's most important tasks will be to expand participation to as many large and small companies as possible. And I urge all of America's apparel companies to become part of this effort. If these people are willing to put their names, their necks, their reputations, and their bottom lines on the bottom line of America, every other company in America in their line of work ought to be willing to do the very same thing. We have spent a lot of time trying to find jobs for everybody in America who wants to work. And we have spent a lot of time saying that people who are able-bodied, who can work, should be required to work. Now we are also reminding ourselves that no one anywhere should have to put their safety or their dignity on the line to support themselves or their children. This is a great day for America, a great day for the cause of human rights, and I believe a great day for free enterprise. And I thank all of those who are here who made it possible. I'm proud that this agreement was industry-led and wholly voluntary. Like the TV industry's decision to rate its programming, like the new private sector effort to help move people from welfare to work, like the high-tech industry's efforts to wire our schools and our classrooms to the Internet, all of them by the year 2000, which we will continue this Saturday. This is further evidence that we can solve our problems by working together in new and creative ways. The apparel industry understands that we all share a stake in preparing our country for the 21st century and preparing the world to be a good partner. Reaching across lines that have too often divided us in the past, this new partnership will create more opportunity for working families. It will demand more responsibility for working conditions. It will build a stronger community here in America and bind us to the community of people all around the world who believe in the value of work, but who also believe in the importance of its dignity and sanctity. Thank you, and God bless you all.